Jay Allen was raised in the hills and swamps of Georgia a very long time ago. He is an internationally recognized speaker and advocate for at-risk youth and has spoken all over the world from southern Australia to northern Alaska. He's a highly rated presenter and is a frequent speaker to youth groups and a popular keynote speaker at professional conferences. After receiving his degree in journalism, he started a career as a technology entrepreneur that led him to help start nine high-tech companies. In 1988, he installed the first computer network in the White House and spent five years working with the White House and other large agencies in Washington, D.C. Jay wrote this. I was going to so, say, I wrote it myself. So, I... so you need to hear this part because I didn't make this up. Jay is married to a tall, beautiful redhead from Silver Spring, Maryland named Casey. They are the parents of four hilarious children. Please help me welcome Jay Allen. Thank you very much. That was very kind of you. I'm so glad I wrote that myself. And uh, it makes me sound much better than I am. I apologize that I am not better looking. My name is Jay Allen, as she said in the introduction. And tomorrow I'm in Dallas. And next week is Detroit. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here in North Andover. Uh, my stepfather, Colonel John Patrick Kane, is from Lawrence. And I visited Lawrence as a small child several times. It was not as nice as North Andover. So I am very happy to be here. Uh, we're going to be talking about social and emotional learning today. I have just a few objectives. Uh, primarily, I want to illustrate the importance of SEL. I know you get that already, but it never hurts to review. I want to provide some practical ideas. That's really the purpose of my coming here, is to give you some practical ideas of what you can do to implement social and emotional learning in your classes. And I want to increase your commitment to act, because it really doesn't do any good if you don't do anything. That's why I came. So let's talk about what social and emotional learning is. According to Daniel Goleman, who is the great guru of social and emotional learning, uh, nearly 90% of professional success comes from social and emotional skills, not from technical skills or intelligence. And you know this, of course, because you may have worked with somebody at some point who is very technically competent, but a horrible person. We all work with people sometimes that are, if you're sitting beside them now, don't look. But occasionally, we all work with people who have low social skills. I'm not talking today because I have great social skills. I'm talking to you because I want to work with people who have great social skills. Daniel Goleman also said that emotional self-control, that ability to uh, delay gratification and, and stifle impulsiveness, underlies accomplishments in every area. So if you're going to be successful at math, it helps if you're a math genius, but most of us aren't math geniuses. What you need to succeed at math is commitment, the ability to be resilient, to do the problems you're given, to be respectful and compliant. Those are social and emotional skills that make people succeed in math. Uh, one of the reasons I get paid to do this is because we get measurably improved outcomes. There was a big meta study done a couple of years ago and they showed that there was about an 11 percentile point improvement in academic outcomes in schools that implemented social and emotional learning. I have recent experience with that. Uh, this is a lovely school. I do not always work in lovely schools. I spend most of my time working in the bottom 5% of schools in the US. Schools under federal control, schools with school improvement grants, whole school reform, that's kind of my thing. So I spend a lot of time working in Newark and Detroit, and Oakland, and Birmingham, and Montgomery, and Atlanta, where the schools are most challenged. And I work at a school in Washington, D.C. called Blow Pierce Academy. I've been working there for three years. I went in three years ago because they were one of the lowest performing schools in Washington, D.C., which was saying something. And let me tell you something about Blow Pierce. Uh, they have no working clocks in the building anywhere. None of the clocks work. That's unusual. That's the first thing I noticed. I thought, oh, the clock in the office is broken. Oh, the clock in the principal's office is broken. Oh, the clock in the hall is broken. Hey, wait a minute. None of the clocks in this school work. So, been working there for three years. I went in because they had a lot of issues. We didn't change the math curriculum. We didn't change the ELA curriculum. We didn't change the social studies curriculum. All we did was add social and emotional skills a systematic curricular approach to social and emotional skills to Blow Pierce Academy. 
And I was back there in September because when their test results came back from the end of the year, they ranked as one of the top 10 schools in DC for growth. They made huge gains over the past three years. And it's only because we taught students to be respectful, to be responsible. Their decisions have consequences. They need to treat other people the way they want to be treated. In other words, we taught all those students what your mama taught you. And it made a huge impact on their academic outcomes. It also provides a great return on investment. That is the time you spend in your classroom providing social and emotional skills gets returned to you in time you get to spend teaching your core subject. The money the school district spends on social and emotional learning gets returned to them in improved outcomes, better student attendance, less students placed out of district. All that money comes back if you're willing to make the investment in time and money in teaching a few basic social and emotional skills. The reason I'm talking to you today, as I mentioned earlier, is not because I'm the lord of social and emotional skills, it's because I was one of your students. That is, well, I had a lot of challenges during my education. I'm a product of the Georgia public education system. You know what the motto of Georgia public education is? Thank goodness for Alabama. <laughs> I got two brothers that graduated in Alabama. I, <laughs> I was born in Fulton County a long time ago and had the great experience of going to 11 different schools in 12 years of public education. And that has implications for your success in school. Uh, I am the oldest of three, five, seven, or nine children, depending on which marriages you count. I've had 22 addresses in six states. I get around. But one of my experiences, and I had many uh, in school, it was a little stressful for me. But in the fourth grade, uh, I remember having a meeting with the principal, and I had to call my father recently and say, did this really happen? Because <laughs> I said, I remember a meeting with the principal in the fourth grade, and my father said, son, you had a lot of meetings with the principal, which is true. I knew every principal of every school I went to very well. But this one was different because in the fourth grade, there was another man there. There was the principal and a man from the district. And my father and I went in, we're sitting here, we're talking to the principal and the man from the district, and the man from the district looks at my father and says, Mr. Allen, we believe your son is mildly retarded. And I said, yes, right? Because if you're gonna told, be told you're retarded, you want it to be mild, right? I thought, that's a win. And so I called my dad and said, did that really happen? And he said, yeah, that's the way I remember it. I didn't think it was that mild. Um, do you think that if you're told in the fourth grade that you are retarded, that you ever forget that in 10 years or 15 years or 50 years? And do you think that has implications for your expectations as you move on through your education? As I went through the school system, I moved in and out of special education. I had the experience of being homeless as a child. I was exposed to my first murder when I was six years old. So when I say I was one of your kids, eh, not quite. I was more like one of the Detroit kids. I grew up in a classic Southern childhood. I grew up in a Merle Haggard song. It was all alcohol, adultery, and murder. But I did survive. And I went to a new school for my senior year, which is always exciting, and uh, showed up at the new school. And this time they weren't interested in putting me in special education because they were just interested in getting me out of the school. But I came to the end of my senior year and I did not have enough credits to graduate. That year, in 1980, they required 305 credit hours to graduate in Georgia. I had 300, which meant I had failed too many classes. Poor planning on my part. But I had just failed English the previous term. So I was able to go back to my English teacher from the previous term and say, you know, you gave me an F in your class and I believe I did D quality work. And she said, nope, I'm pretty sure it was F quality work. And I said, I'll take your class again. And she said, you know what? Now that you mention it, I believe it was C quality work. <laughs> and I actually had the transcript. I just found it recently. I was going through things, opened up my diploma, and my senior year transcript was in there. And there is an F in English marked through with red, and a C is written in. And that's how I got out of high school, which is, you know, they don't have a special award for that. like. Magna cum sucks. Um, no, I was bad, but I got out of school. 
And here's the funny thing, within five years of leaving high school, I was working in the White House. Now, if you're familiar with the White House, you would not be surprised to know that. Um, <laughs> there is, I discovered in five years, a lot of conduct disorder in the White House. And there always has been, there always will be. I was there through three presidential, well, okay, I was there for the end of the Reagan administration, the entire George H.W. Bush administration, the beginning of the Clinton administration, so I got to see a lot of change in the White House, and it was always crazy. If you had been my fourth grade teacher, or my seventh grade teacher, or an eighth grade teacher, mind you might not have guessed that I had much potential because I wasn't shining. I wasn't successful at just about anything to do with school. And yet, there was something in me. Mark Twain said, Thousands of geniuses live and die undiscovered, either by themselves or by others. You have students you teach whose potential is not immediately apparent because they struggle, because they have problems that you can't fix. They come to you with learning disabilities and cognitive impairments and anxiety, and they come with a full raft of problems that are not your problem, right? And yet, your responsibility is to teach them, to change them, to move them forward in their lives. And that's what I came to talk to you about. Because in those 12 years of public education, I had some very good teachers. And that is the reason I'm talking to you today. I had a third grade teacher change my life. A seventh grade teacher saved me. A ninth grade teacher showed me that I could do something hard that became the foundation of my entire career in technology. Essentially, my job for many years was starting, running, and selling technology companies. And it turns out that to do that, all I needed to do was listen to people and solve their problems. That is a social and emotional skill that I picked up from people like you in my education that served me well for the rest of my life. What I want to talk to you about today is what's going on here. What does this mean to you? This is a survey done uh, through the school nurses. It was a self-reported survey of parents and other data they collected. And I just wanted to point out the change between 2016-17 school year and the 2017-2018 school year. Uh, there was a substantial increase in every category, in ADHD, in autism spectrum, depression, but there was a huge increase in anxiety. And that's not unique to North Andover Public Schools. That is happening everywhere. Everywhere I go, we're dealing with the most anxious generation of children seen, I don't know when, kids have been this anxious. The Great Depression, World War II, I can't say. And now, keep in mind, these numbers, uh, some of them are doctor referred, some of them are self-reporting. They may not be precise, but they are indicative and they are fairly accurate based on my experience in other school districts. So, here I am, the, the expert speaking to you today. Uh, <clears throat> where do you think that anxiety comes from? Where do you think the increases in depression and ADHD, where does that come from? Well, I'm the authority and I'm here to tell you, I have no idea where that comes from. We have theories, you can guess. Uh, one thing we know is that there's been a generational change. Your parents were raised by parents who survived the Great Depression. You were raised by parents who had parents who survived the Great Depression. You raised your kids and now we come to this generation and the next generation where that resilience seems to have faded. One thing I do know is that the kids I work with uh, a lot in their late teens, early 20s, spend a lot of time with them. And these are the kids who were one, two, three, four years old when 9-11 happened. And that may have had an impact on how they view the world and their expectations for their lives. 
I cannot say where this comes from. But I can say that it is consistent with national trends. It is consistent everywhere I go. That anxiety is high. And it impacts performance, outcomes, attendance, ability to function in school. The question for us is, how do we respond to that? What do you do as a teacher? What does that mean for you? What are the implications for you in your classroom and for your career? We respond, and this is why I'm talking to you today, with skills. If we're going to respond to a crisis of anxiety, of mental health, we need to be specific and clear. We respond with skills that students can understand and apply in their lives. And we respond with appropriate support. If we want to stop referring students out of the district, we have to have the supports within the district. And when I say support for students, I mean support for you, so that those students can succeed in your classroom. And we need to do it intentionally, mindfully. We have to have a plan and we have to execute on the plan. At a district level, the plan is forming. At a district level, things are coming together. But ultimately, that makes very little difference if it doesn't impact you. You're the one who has to make an intentional decision about how you're going to deliver skills to your students in a way that they understand and remember. What does this mean for you? Well, there is a district level commitment to social and emotional learning. You've probably seen that by now. You've probably heard that. You've probably heard Nikki speak by now. Nikki Murphy is driving this and she's doing a great job. The survey data collected last year, you did two surveys by an outside consultant early, early in this year, or yeah, early this year, the end of last year. That data, that survey data is guiding the development of the plan. The action plan is forming around the information we have in hand. Nikki Murphy, who introduced me, thank you very much, and brought me here, thank you very much, is working with each school. She will be available to you at your school site to provide professional development as you need in the areas you think you need help in. And Nikki and the building leaders are going to work together to form specific plans for each school site. And they're going to provide ongoing support. Because the one thing no one appreciates is being told, you have a new responsibility. No, we're not paying you anymore. And guess what? We're never going to talk about it again. Because that never happens in education, right? <laughs> where you have, you're given some program, some instruction, and you never hear it about it again? No, this is not that. Already, the district has made this commitment. Already, you've begun to see the implications. This is going to go four years into the future because the kids are not likely to get less anxious unless we do something. So, what we're going for, what we're trying to improve specifically is self-efficacy. There are four areas that we're emphasizing. Self-efficacy, that is agency. The ability for a student to realize that they have power to control their own life. Because you tell them what to do, right? And they're supposed to do it. Not always very compliant. We want them to feel empowered and realize they can do that. They can make choices. They are not helpless. They are not hopeless. They have power to make decisions. Self-management, the ability to control your emotions to manage your stuff, to show up on time and be responsible. For crying out loud, to have a pen. Where do all the pens go by eighth grade? And social awareness. We want them to be aware of others. They're not the only person in the universe. They may not realize that for a few more years, but we're working on it. We want them to know that there are other people and they have needs, they have feelings, and they have to interact appropriately with those other, pe other people. And we want to create a growth mindset, which is capability. We want students to recognize that they have the capability to do difficult things, to succeed at math, to put together a well-constructed paragraph, to understand how the world came to be where it is today and where it might be going in the future. Because the students you teach are responsible for owning that future. So they need that growth mindset. The question becomes, though, why is it so hard for students to do this? Why is this so hard? These are basic social and emotional skills. Your mama taught you, and you picked them up, and you're good at it. Here you are, you're functioning, you're licensed by the state of Massachusetts. Congratulations. Why is it hard for a 15-year-old to use the skills that you use effortlessly every day? Any ideas? I'll give you one. Oh, what were you going to say? Impulsivity. Impulsivity. 
they do not have good impulse control. That, that is true. Their self-management skills can be quite low. Another one? They haven't been taught. Thank you very much. Sometimes they don't know what to do. They don't always know what the right thing to do is in every situation. Uh, I got a call a few years ago from a school in Arizona, in Guadalupe, Arizona. Uh, just north of Tempe is a little barrio called Guadalupe. And it has poverty like you don't usually see in North America. Because there are people there living in cardboard houses with blue tarp roofs and you couldn't do that in Massachusetts because they would melt in the rain. But there's poverty there, crazy poverty, and it is heavily influenced by Mexican drug cartels. And there is a high degree of involvement with their students with gangs. Gang affiliation is very high, violence is high. So they built an alternative high school called Compadre High School in Guadalupe, Arizona. They built this, this high school, it does not say Compadre High School for Mexican gang kids, but that's what they built it for. They got Compadre High School and they called me and said, Mr. Allen, this is Compadre High School and we need some help. They said, uh, we have uh, out of control violence here. And I said, you started an alternative high school for Mexican gang kids? Really? Violent, didn't see that coming. And she said, yeah, we're having like five fights a day. We got six resource officers on staff and this school is in danger of being shut down. Can you help us? And I said, I am totally unqualified to do that. And they said, it pays $5,000. I said, I will be right there. And so I fly to Arizona and I drive out to Guadalupe and I sit there and I do what we do in education. I did my observations. You know how that goes. You have people observe your classroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They look very judgmental while they're doing it too. So I was sitting there doing observations and usually by 10 o'clock in the morning you know what's going on but you have to sit there all day and try not to look too judgmental like. So I spent the whole day with them. At the end of the day I got together with the administration and I said, I can see what your problem is. <laughs> and they said, gang kids? I said, no, that, that is a problem. But the problem is you're speaking the wrong language. And they said, we speak Spanish. And I said, it's not your Spanish that's the problem. It's what you're saying. You're saying things like, be respectful. And they don't know what that means. They don't know what that looks like. You're saying, go down the hall and talk to Mr. Gonzalez. They do not know how to walk down the hall. They don't know how to sit at a desk. Every day the teachers are saying things to the kids that the kids do not understand. They don't know what you're talking about. They don't know what to do. So I said, here's the plan. And we sat down and we came together with a plan. For the first two academic weeks of the next school year, they would just teach these social and emotional skills. They would teach how to go to school. Basically, they would teach a bunch of 15 to 18 year olds like they were kindergartners. So for the first two weeks, they taught them how to walk down the hall. When you walk down the hall, and I, you're probably pretty good at this by now. But when you walk down the hall, you keep your hands to yourself. You do not throw down any gang signs. You do not bump into anybody. You're not mean mugging anybody. Your business is walking down the hall. You just walk down the hall. And the kids are like, strange, but I can see that working. <laughs> and they said, when you sit in a desk, you do not look like a dish towel thrown over a desk. Your feet go in front of the chair and your hands go on top of the desk and you have a book or a notebook and a pen and the students are like hmm and they said and when you talk to the teacher you look the teacher in the eye this is what respect looks like yes ma'am no sir thank you and you don't just do that to the staff you do that to everyone in the school all the other students you treat them with respect the respect you want to receive and of course, this was in March, right? I sit down with the administration in March, and then I fly off, yay, and the check clears, yay. And I wonder, did that work? And you have to spend, you know, months waiting to see if this stuff works, and kind of nervous to see if they'll call me back. But in October of that year, I get a call back, and they said, it's working, and I'm like, I am so relieved. And they said, yeah, we're done. We're down from five fights a day to like two fights a week. They said, we have achieved a sustainable level of violence. <laughs> I do not think that should be a thing. But they were very happy. They got their school to a level they could manage. And they did it by teaching some basic social and emotional skills. You sometimes assume, because we all do, it's not you, we assume that other people know what we know. You assume that students come in knowing how to be respectful, how to be compliant. 
And that's not always the case. They don't always know what to do because they haven't been taught. Because frankly, they did not have your mama or your grandmother or your father. See, one of the things I know about you is that somebody loved you. Right? Somebody taught you how to be a decent human being. It could have been foster parents. It doesn't matter who. But somebody loved you and they taught you what you needed to know. And here you are, a functioning adult. You can afford a car. Okay, most of you can afford a car. And uh, you are functioning in society. You're a licensed professional in the state of Massachusetts because you knew some basic social skills. The students you teach don't always know that. And you can't assume by the quality of the car they're dropped off in or the size of the house they live in that they're necessarily getting these skills. And that's why we remediate everyone. So, that's one reason they don't do the right thing, because they don't know what to do. Another reason is, they get mixed messages. They get conflicting messages. Hopefully you don't hear this in the seventh grade, but I guarantee if you were working in the elementary school, you would have students say to you, my daddy told me if anybody got in my face, I should knock them out. You will still hear that occasionally in the middle school, but that's a mixed message, right? Um, they get their value system playing Fortnite till 2 a.m. every night, right? Grand Theft Auto, movies, music, popular culture, better stop before I get in trouble. Um, there are a lot of mixed messages in society. There are a lot of people who do not practice kindness, patience, listening, generosity, service. And so, you have to be clear and consistent. You believe that education is the key to a better life. That's why you work in education. And you work every day of your professional life to change the lives of students. And you succeed most of the time. In fact, I'm going to say you succeed 100% of the time because I am pretty sure that you never have a student come through your class that does not learn something, right? They may not meet state standards. They may not meet your expectations. But they learn something. And that means you move that human being forward in their life. You are clear in your message that education is the key to better opportunities in your life and that these basic social and emotional skills, the things that make you successful in your life, the things that make other people love you, are the things that will make other people love them. And of course, I don't know if you know this, but it is hard to do the right thing. And I can demonstrate that very easily because I'm sure this morning you were up at 5 a.m. in your spin class exercising hard, right? Usually there's some lady in the back, very skinny, who says, I was. <laughs> yes, we know you were. I was not. You might not have been in your spin class either because I don't want to get up at 5 a.m. and exercise. Do you? It's hard to do the right thing. I checked into the hotel last night at 8 o'clock. And they said what they always say when I check in. The exercise room is over there. And I said, where is breakfast? because I am very interested in that. And that's the reality. It's hard to do the right, it's hard to eat right, right? I hear, here I am in Massachusetts, and uh, you've got some good food in Massachusetts, but I will be in Dallas tomorrow, and there will be meat, a lot of meat. Not necessarily good for me meat. And then I'm in Alabama where they fry everything, and sometimes I go to California where it's not even legal to fry anything, and they will serve me kale. Eat, you're in California. <laughs> I'm leaving soon, <laughs> I can live for a few days. It's hard to eat right. It's hard to exercise, it's hard to drive the speed limit. It is hard to be nice to a student who actually only came to school today to piss you off. <laughs> and you know there are students who do that. They're like, I don't feel like going, oh wait, I got Ms. Jones today, I better go. I think I can make her cry. <laughs> or I got, I got Mr. Hill, I bet I can get him to retire early. <laughs> there are kids who are trying to break you down, disrupt you, crack you, but you are the cool, calm professional. <laughs> Inside, you're saying, 13 years, nine months, 12 days to retirement. <laughs> you will not break me. 
It's hard to do the right thing. If it's hard for us as licensed professional adults, how hard is it for a seventh grader with conduct disorder? For an eighth grader who is just not catching on to math. Do you know there's a big wave of dropouts around the eighth grade? We know that most of the kids who drop out of high school are going to decide in the eighth grade whether or not they're going to continue in high school. And you know what that dropout bulge is? We, we can predict it. It's called pre-algebra or math eight, as it may be called now. But when they get to those concepts, when math becomes very abstract, a lot of kids decide school is not for them. And it's hard. Now, you may not have a high dropout rate in North Andover Public Schools, but you do have students who struggle. And because it's hard for them, you've got to give them a reason to do the hard thing. You have, in your district, the RAISE program. It is <laughs> a, uh, a structured program that starts in kindergarten, actually probably pre-K, and it is growing in structure over the years. The more and more skills are accruing to it, but it's very simple. If you're not familiar with RAISE, it starts with the idea that students will demonstrate respect. Now, the question becomes for you is, how do you teach students to show respect? How do you translate raise and respect in your classroom into something that becomes a practical skill for your students? Here's a simple idea. Create a code of conduct for your classroom. Ask students how they want to be treated. And one of the first things they will say is, I want to be treated with respect. And you say, perfect. That becomes our code of conduct. We will treat others with respect because you're going to treat other people the way you want to be treated. I want to be treated with dignity. I want to be treated kindly. I want to be treated with empathy. I want to be treated fairly. I've made a lot of these codes of conduct. That discussion about respect becomes the foundation of their insight that if they want respect, they have to show respect. And you teach them what respect looks like. So that's one way you could bring respect into your classroom. Make it a classroom rule and make it a rule that they understand, they appreciate. Then students will demonstrate achievement. This is a school they're supposed to learn. In fact, your professional life is pretty much driven by their achievement. You were evaluated based on their success at learning. Human beings are designed for achievement. It's built in. We need to achieve. That's why we learn to walk. Walking is hard. You would think if you watch somebody learn to walk, Watch a one-year-old walking is hard. They fall down, they bonk their head, they cry, but then they get up and they try again. They're resilient. They do the hard thing. They want the achievement of walking. That never leaves us. Every human being wants achievement. But what happens is, those who don't succeed academically, take that eighth grader who's struggling with eighth grade math, they can decide, I'm going to school today and I'm not going to succeed at math, but you know what I can do? I can succeed at disrupting a math class. That's pretty easy. It takes very little skill. And there are literally students who will go home at the end of the day and tally up how much they were able to keep other students from learning and that was their achievement for the day. They made you lose your cool, that's an achievement. They own achievements but they're negative achievements. Our challenge is to get them to identify positive achievements, to want those positive achievements. And uh, one of the ways we do that is we let them taste success. As you know, on the bell curve, abilities are distributed. Performance is distributed. Not every student is a model student. Some of us, as I used to like to point out, have to be at the far end of the curve so you can look good. That was my job in school, to make the people on the other end of the curve feel good about themselves. Well, you have students who don't taste success. I did not get trophies, certificates. I did not have report cards that went up on the refrigerator. We expect students to want to succeed, but it is just not the case because if you don't know the flavor of success, you don't know if you want it. You say, education is your key to a better life. Getting A's is going to be great. They haven't gotten A's. They don't know what that feels like. You have to engineer opportunities for students to succeed so you can say, that's what it feels like. You like that? 
You taste that, and that's success. And I can get you more success. It's what I do for a living, I'm a teacher. Engineer opportunities for success so they know the flavor of success because some of them have tasted bitterness and some of them have tasted, tasted ashes. Some of them know loss. And you have to get them to taste achievement, success. So they will want more. And it's hard sometimes. It was hard to get a kid like me to taste success, to want achievement. But it is possible. And that's one of the values we're putting in. Uh, North Andover students will demonstrate inclusion. We live in a society where every student is now isolated by their cell phone, right? They live on those screens and it creates more isolation, more anxiety, more depression. Okay, I'm blaming cell phones in ways that data may or may not support. But we do see the rise in isolation. We do see the rise in anxiety and depression. How do we get them past that? Create more opportunities for shared experiences. Shared experiences become a foundation for relationships, and relationships are ultimately what drives human beings. My children were raised on rock and rope in the West. <laughs> Basically, my children say, we were raised in a wilderness survival program. That is totally unfair. We never had a chance. Yes, they did not have a chance to act out because we created shared experiences so that they knew they could rely on themselves. By the time my children are six years old, they know they can tie a knot their life depends on. And the only way you find out is you tie a knot your life has to depend on. Find shared experiences for your students. Build those shared experiences and build relationships between the students and they become more inclusive. North Andover students will demonstrate service. Service is very powerful. But it has been lost. Remember a few minutes ago I said, your parents were raised by parents who survived the Great Depression and your parents raised you and so that the echoes of the Great Depression came down to our generation and have slowly elapsed. There was a word that was used during the Great Depression earlier in previous centuries, sacrifice. People sacrificed for their community, for their families, for their countries. That is almost entirely gone. The whole concept of that sacrifice has evaporated. And with that service, so we find opportunities for them to serve. We teach them the importance of that because it is possible in the 21st century for a student, a child to grow up having never served anyone. Never helped a neighbor move, never helped a neighbor take her trash in, never mowed her lawn for free. Isn't that weird? It's so strange to me and yet I see it all the time. And that is how I was raised. And finally, empathy. Uh, North Andover students will demonstrate empathy. Empathy is an abstract concept, but it is something that every student can learn, and they learn it very simply. They feel it. In order for a student to learn empathy, they must feel it. And I have many examples of ways to teach this. I'll give you one very brief, well this isn't one you can use, okay? This is not something you can do in your classroom, but I'll give you an example because it was very powerful for me. Years ago working in Canada, I discovered a program called Roots of Empathy and they would work with students in youth corrections, kids in jail. I spent a lot of time with youth in custody, but this program was like nothing I'd ever seen before. They would go into a correctional facility with young women and they would take six young women, put them in a room, and these would be young women convicted of assault, drug possession, drug distribution, grand theft auto. On average, when a young man or young woman goes into state custody, they've had 52 encounters with the law. So nobody gets busted on their first offense. So by the time you're in custody, you have had a record. So six young women with serious criminal records and somebody would bring in a baby they would find a woman in the community, a volunteer, to bring in her baby for these girls. And these girls, now you know what happens when you bring the baby into the room. All the girls are like, baby! And something at the base of their brain goes, squirt, and they're like, oh baby, I need the baby. They love the baby. And everybody wants to hold the baby and talk about the baby. And so they hold the baby and pass around the baby. But after a few minutes of everybody getting to know the baby and everybody gets a turn to hold her, they all look at the baby and then the facilitator says, tell me about this baby. And they're like, what do you mean? Well, 
the facilitator says, tell me what her life is going to be like. Is she going to be pretty? And all the girls go, oh, she's going to be so beautiful. Well, is she going to be smart? Oh, she's so smart. She's not just going to graduate from high school. She's going to graduate from college. Is she going to be happy? Oh, she's going to get married. She's going to have kids. She's going to have a great career. And they describe this dream life for this baby. Because everybody sees that, right? All those girls see in that baby all the potential in the world. And then the facilitator says, while they're holding the baby, says, how old should this baby be when she has sex? And the girls are like, 26. And then the facilitator says, how old should she be when she tries meth? And the girls are like, she should never touch meth. Are you crazy? And the facilitator says, how old should she be when she goes to jail? And the girls are like, you're crazy. She's not going to jail. And then the facilitator says, you were somebody's baby. You were beautiful and smart. You were perfect. You were designed for happiness. And some bad things happened to you. Some things that were not your fault happened to you. And here you are. But you're still somebody's baby. And you're still beautiful. And you're still smart. And you can still be happy. And those girls, something inside them opens up. And they don't just know what empathy is. They have felt it. They have empathy not just for that child, but it reflects back. That mirror sends it back to them, and they know how it feels to have your heart broken by somebody you love. And they see in themselves that opportunity to do better. So let's talk about what you could do as middle school teachers. Let me be specific. One of the things you can do is create positive relationships. Now, I could actually talk, no kidding, for six hours on how to build positive relationships in a middle school. Don't have time. Suffice it to say, there are things that you know you can do that create relationships with students. I don't know if you know this, but when you talk to someone 20 years after they were in middle school, they never say, oh, we had the Roberts English series, or we had the Macmillan Advanced Math Curriculum. <laughs> you know what they say? We had Mrs. Gonzalez. I had Mr. Phillips. They tell you about the people. Children aren't changed by curricula or programs. They're changed by human beings. And there are things you can do to improve those relationships, to create positive relationships. And it starts with you and the compassion you have doesn't mean you slack off on any of your rules what it means is that you understand there are reasons they do the things they do because sometimes they don't know what the right thing to do is and sometimes they get mixed messages mixed signals and sometimes it's just hard to do the right thing and you understand that and you give them some space to get better so you create positive relationships I wish I could spend more time on that but there are a lot of ways to do that, but it begins with knowing their names and thinking about where they're coming from and what they're going through. Uh, you can engineer opportunities for success. Create those opportunities, whatever your subject area is. You've got lessons you know everybody's going to do well at, right? So make sure that you point out to the students who are not normally successful when they have success, you did that great. Good job on that. You got all of these right on this quiz. Find opportunities to engineer success so you can point out to a specific student that this is the flavor of success. This is what it feels like to be right, to do well. Let them know the taste is there and then tell them, my job is for you to taste success all the time. And I want that very badly for you. So work with me, work with me, listen to me, and I will help you taste this. I'll help you get it. Find opportunities for them to succeed. Integrate these social and emotional skills we're talking about. If you teach ELA, all of literature is a great flowing lesson in social and emotional skills. Good choices, bad choices. 
That is the sweep and scope of all literature, and you can integrate social and emotional skills easily into ELA. As I mentioned earlier, when it comes to math, it's not math brilliance that allows people to succeed at math. Most of the time, it's persistence. Most of the time, it's doing the problems you give them to do. It's being respectful to you and listening in class. It's the social and emotional skills that determine who succeeds and who fails, not natural capacity. I, it turned out, had plenty of capability. I had the capacity. What I didn't have was a reason. I lacked social and emotional skills. But I had teachers who did not give up on me. <laughs> I, uh, I was unpacking <laughs> books when I finally built the bookshelves. You know how you always want to build those bookshelves? I built the bookshelves. And, uh, and as I was unpacking the books, a picture fell out. My eighth grade English teacher. She gave me that picture in 1979, 78. Anyway, I thought, wow, she gave me that now. She'd probably go to jail. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I got online. I found her on Facebook. And I say, hey, I found that picture you gave me in 1978. <laughs> And I said, you still look the same. And she said, I remember now why I liked you so much. Um, she had an impact on me. So that 27 years later, when that picture falls out, I pick it up, and i got to find her. In fact, last time I went to visit that teacher, she was a principal on Martha's Vineyard. I took the ferry over to go see my eighth grade English teacher because she had an impact on me. Because here I am talking to you because of a teacher. Isn't that crazy? Integrate these skills into your core subjects. It's not that hard. Build intrinsic motivation. The way you build intrinsic motivation is you say to a student, when, they, when you catch them doing something well, when you catch them doing anything at all, it doesn't have to be in the academic discipline, if they hold the door for somebody, if they are respectful, if they help somebody move their bag, they help somebody with their wheelchair, if you catch them doing anything good at all, you freeze that moment and you say, hey, thanks for doing that. How'd that make you feel? And they're like, I don't know, good, I guess. And you say, that's right. That's how it feels when I do something right, too. Every time you point out to a student that when they do the right thing, they feel good, you create mindfulness in that student. You make them slightly more mature. Every opportunity you have to catch a student doing something right and point out how that feels to them, is an opportunity to build intrinsic motivation because that is the definition of intrinsic motivation. It is the reward we receive of the good feeling for doing the right thing. And the way you build it is you point it out, you reinforce it, you make it conscious, intentional, and mindful. And finally, model positive behavior. If you could be half as good as your students seem to think you are, you'd be doing really well which means you need to take some of those pictures off Facebook, seriously. Model positive behavior. I was just <laughs> at an awkward experience just a few weeks ago because I was in a school district last year in Pennsylvania. I was in the school district in Pennsylvania, and I was working with the teachers during the day like this, and suddenly everybody's phones start going off at the same time, and everybody's pulling out their phones, and they're all looking at each other, oh, they did it, and you know, the room just explodes, everybody's buzzing. And what the texts they were getting were saying was, the school had just fired the superintendent. The school board met during the day. School boards do not meet during the day. That, that is very unusual, but the school board met during the day on this occasion to fire the superintendent because he had already been in jail for 90 days. And, and, uh, <laughs> and I tell this story everywhere I go, and I tell teachers, Look, the least you could do is not wind up on the evening news in a bad way, right? If you could just avoid being on the evening news for any criminal offenses, that would be great. Just model positive behavior. Be a decent citizen. And you get that, right? You will avoid being on the evening news. Well, the awkward thing that happened was a couple weeks ago, I was in a school district and I told that story and I was in Pennsylvania and they said, yeah, that was us. And I'm like, oh. Well, you're world famous now. <laughs> Model positive behaviors. If you could be 2% kinder, 3% more patient, it's hard. 
I don't know if I can do it. But if you could be a little better, they can be a little better. And that's what we're going for. Those are five things you can do. Create positive relationships. Be mindful of that. And you know, you know teachers who are really good at this, right? Steal from them. Or as I always tell people, uh, you know, have a positive attitude. And if you can't have a positive attitude, find someone who has a positive attitude and pretend like you're them. Because that's a good way to start. Emulation. So create positive relationships. Engineer success. Integrate these skills, these social and emotional skills we're talking about, we're going to continue to talk about for the next few years, into your core curricula. Build intrinsic motivation by pointing out when they have success. Remind them of the flavor of success. Teach them to want it. And model positive behavior. Every interaction matters with your students. Uh, I got a card at Thanksgiving a few years ago, a thank you card. This card comes at Thanksgiving. And it says, uh, thank you very much, you changed my life. Uh, she says, 12 years ago, when I was 12 years old, I'm like, it takes 12 years to get a thank you card. So I get this thank you card. She says, my parents were divorced. My mom moved to the town where you were living. And you and your wife were great. You taught us to climb. You taught us to repel. You did all this fun stuff. But she said, you did one thing that changed my life. I'm thinking, I must be pretty cool. And she said, one time I was in a class. And you happened to be in that class. I was not a teacher. I just happened to be in a class. And she said, I was asked to read something. And she said, after I read it, you leaned over and said to me, you read very well. And I thought, sounds like me. And she said, my mom finished school. After a year, we moved away, left the state, never came back. She said, but I stayed in school, graduated, started college. She said, my sophomore year, I lost my job. And I was freaked out because I needed that job to survive. Uh, and she said, I... Uh, I went down the student union, union building and looked at the jobs. Do you remember the jobs in the student union building? Those are the worst jobs. Barn custodian, men's locker room attendant, telemarketing. And you're looking at all these jobs thinking, what am I going to have to do to put myself through school? She said she was looking at those jobs and she saw one on-air announcer for the student radio station. And she thought, that doesn't have anything to do with my major. And then she said in this card, she writes, I heard in my head your voice say, you read very well. And she thought, you know what? I do read very well. And she took the number and she called the station. She got the job and she worked her way through school as a radio announcer for the next five years. She graduated in electrical engineering. She was a smart girl. Every student who comes to your school already knows what's wrong with them. You do not need to tell them. Plenty of people have told them what's wrong with them. What they do not know very often is what's right with them. And the smallest interaction can make the biggest difference. I have found that when I talk to kids, the thing that has the most impact, and it's the stupidest thing, is when I look them in the eye and say, you're going to be okay. Because sometimes no one's told them that yet. They don't know if they're going to be okay. That's the reason they're crazy in the seventh and eighth grade, is because they don't know if they're gonna be okay. And somebody's gotta tell them, you're going to be okay. The smallest, stupidest thing you say could change the course of a child's life. I'm glad you're here. You look beautiful today. Good job on that test. I heard you won the softball game. You read very well. Isn't that crazy? You have a job where you show up every day and you have the chance to change the course of someone's life and you do it every year. Students show up at this school not knowing what they're in for and you are waiting for them to walk into your classroom so you can reach them, touch them, change them forever and they will never forget you. And guess what? If you sold insurance, nobody says, well, my insurance agent in the eighth grade was. No, nobody remembers anybody but their teachers. You make a difference. You change their lives. You need to tell your students they're going to be okay. We're trying to create self-efficacy, self-management, social awareness, and growth mindset. But most of all, we're trying to create hope in these students. Because no one who goes to this school should go to prison. No one who goes to this school should live in poverty or misery. Sometimes people say, it's hard to change the families. And I'll tell you what, you cannot change families now. But if you do your job right, 
in North Andover Middle School, in 20 years, some child will grow up in North Andover having never been hit, having never been hungry, having never been afraid, just because her daddy had you in the seventh grade, or his mama had you in the eighth grade. Isn't that crazy? That's how you change families. You do it with the kids you've got this year, between now and the end of the year. You make them better, and their kids are raised better. And that's why I came to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time today, and thank you for what you do every day. Good luck.